it's a mystery, but it's kind of not. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, as much as I, there's a woman murdered, it happens very early in the book, um, and we do find out who done it. Mm. But I didn't. <laughs> I, I quickly lost. I, I, I hate to say this too. I quickly lost interest in, in that part of your book. Yeah, no, yeah. but but, um, and yeah. I think that was the right thing. I had, um, you know, a great compliment was given to me by Tom Wolf, who read the book and said to me, you know, the thing I really love about this book is that there's a murder in it, but you don't care. Yes. And okay, good. I mean, yeah, good company then. Yeah, you are in great company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, oh, you know, I mean, that's a that's a great compliment because no, the murder is it's not. There's a sort of slight, you know. There's a noir element to the book, and it's not just the murder. There's some other, you know, features of that in there, sort of gothic and noirish. Um, and um, but the murder was never intended to be a secret of who done it. It's not a who done it. Um, it's pretty obvious who done it. And even if you might be slightly confused, you're not going to be like, "Wow, that is such a surprise," you know. Um, and I really never made a huge effort to try to conceal it. Um, the murder is more of a way to examine the kind of fault lines that are running through this very idyllic place um, and to show that like when you flip it over, you know, I mean, first of all, it's sort of a class difference that's, you know, is a way of, without being heavy handed, with, or trying not to be, maybe, I don't know if I've completely succeeded, but that was the, that was the gist of it, that was my reasoning, um, to examine some of those things from that time period without, you know, making moral pronouncements on them. Um, having it be just a fact, the dead body shows up, this is who it is, this is what's been happening. Um, and then the way that it reverberates um, with the rest of the characters and causes like sort of minor, the fault line split, causes a, you know, a, a, an earthquake for them. Uh, the, the setting, it's, um, where, where is it exactly? It's a fictional Martha's Vineyard. I okay. mean... It seemed like that. Yeah, it is, and I mean, you know, I think, I'm not sure if it says that on there, but definitely my American Pilgrim just went ahead and put Martha's Vineyard on there, and I said, well, okay. Um, I never named it because, well, I mean, first of all, when I wrote it, I wanted the sort of space to not have someone say to me, well, that's not really, you know, how that. You can't turn left there, you actually run into the ocean rather than into Exactly, the so um, I never named it for basically that reason, and just to give myself a little more freedom from that. Um, but it's a place where I've spent my childhood summers in Egertown, which is where this takes place mainly, um, primarily. And um, so, yeah, it's like a huge sense memory place for me, you know, it's like sort of very deep childhood memories. Of being there um, so you know it was, a, it was a good place to draw from there's a lot of sex in this book not 50 shades of gray sex but <laughs> but you realize that it's like oh he's doing her and she's and it's like yeah. oh my there's not that many sex scenes no but, no yeah. it's, but there's when I started adding up who was who doing was, what with who it's like yeah. they're very busy they are very busy they're extremely busy um, that's again to me. It's sort of part and parcel of their sort of, again this sort of tiger, tiger carnivorous nature that they have. And I mean, and each character has a reason for doing what they do. Um, you know, in Nick's case, it's because it's some way for her to prove something to herself, given that Hughes, her husband, is not seemingly attentive to her. Um, you know, Hughes just fell in love with somebody, and that just sort of happened. You know, um, and then with Helena. It's, you know, for even more sort of dark and nefarious reasons, mainly that she's basically out of it so much of the time and is being sort of manipulated. Uh, the tiger uh, in Red Weather comes from a poem? Yes, it comes from a um, poem by Wallace Stevens' Disillusionment of Ten O'Clock, um, which is sort of about homogeneity um, and how only, you know, rarely do we see these sort of sparks of imagination um, within... Um, this very sort of flat and um, homogeneous world. And so for me, you know, this is what a poem says, you know, the only one who was different in essence was this drunk sailor asleep in his booth dreaming of tigers in red weather. And um, so I thought these people in a way were these people who all, who all wanted to be that one spark. You know, they all wanted to be that different and discreet and unique. Um, and so they were, you know, that dream that this drunk sailor has. Good job. I, I really enjoyed it. Good. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fun book. Yes, it's a fun book. And a creepy fun book. So yeah, far. creepy is sort of my, my middle name. Um, I, <laughs> I like creepy. <laughs> it's like I, I can, for some reason, I can imagine sitting in Martha's Vineyard reading this book 
um, while everybody else is reading something trashy like Fifty Shades of Grey, but, yeah. but the smart people will be reading yours. Yeah, someone said it was the, the smart, the thinking man or woman's beach read. Well, you know, I hate the term beach read, but if that's what it is, great. Um, yeah. The book is Tigers in Red Weather. I've been speaking with the author Liza Klausman and Tigers in Red Weather, published by Doubleday Canada. It's a Bond Street book.